we're going to start to work our way through the water cycle. We won't cover all the pools and processes this week. Some will come later in the semester. However, we will work through the pools and processes that relate in some way to atmospheric moisture. As you recall, the chapter we read this week was called Atmospheric Moisture. Atmospheric moisture, which is simply the humidity in the air around you, is one very important pool in the hydrologic cycle. In this week's assignment, you will be asked to draw a pool and process model of the hydrologic cycle. What is shown here is not a pool and process model. It's simply a diagram. A pool and process model uses boxes to represent pools where the water hangs out and arrows to represent processes that move water from one pool to another. In our model of the hydrologic cycle, evaporation transfers water from the ocean pool to the atmospheric moisture pool. Strangely, this diagram in your book does not include atmospheric moisture. When you draw your model, you'll want to include that pool. It might look something like this. A box around the word ocean with an arrow labeled evaporation leading up to another box, another pool, labeled atmospheric moisture. Notably, evaporation does not lead directly to clouds. It leads to atmospheric moisture, the moisture in the air around us. From there, condensation, which we've labeled here, takes the atmospheric moisture water and brings it to another pool, which I've labeled here as clouds. You can imagine what would occur next. I'm not going to continue drawing your homework problem for you, but precipitation comes from clouds down to surface water, etc. Think about what other pools and processes you'll include. Remember that any place that water hangs out, you should label and name as a specific pool. And the processes are the arrows that move water from one pool to another. For this week's assignment, I asked you to try to come up with a model with six pools and eight processes. All right, let's step back and get to the real topic of this video clip, which is evaporation. Your book gives a good definition of evaporation the process by which liquid water is converted to gaseous water, a cooling process because latent heat is stored. So what is happening during evaporation? Well, the hydrogen bonds that hold the liquid water together are being broken. And notably, this can occur at any temperature, though we'll soon discuss that it's going to occur faster at higher temperatures but that breaking of the hydrogen bonds can occur at any temperature. It takes energy to break these bonds, however, so when water evaporates, that energy is removed from the system and stored as latent heat. Since that energy is removed from the system, the remaining water is cooler. I'm going to repeat all that one more time. When water evaporates, the hydrogen bonds that are holding the liquid water molecules together are broken, and it takes energy to break those bonds and release the individual water molecules into the air. And so that energy that is used to do that essentially takes energy away from the system, so the remaining water is cooler than it started. Look at the definition again, especially the second phrase. Evaporation is a cooling process. This is very important, and we discussed it back when we addressed temperature and global temperature patterns back in Chapter 4. When water evaporates, the remaining water is cooled because it took energy to break those hydrogen bonds that held the liquid water together. This energy is called the latent heat of vaporization, and that energy will be released again when the water recondenses. Thus, condensation is a warming process. Keep reviewing this until it makes sense. Simply remembering that evaporation is a cooling process will actually take you a long way. And to help you remember that, think of your body sweating when it gets hot. Our bodies use evaporation to cool us. When we sweat, we evaporate water to make us cool. There are three factors that influence how fast evaporation occurs and how much evaporation occurs. 
you should be very able to list these three processes and discuss each one of them. We'll list them first here. First, temperature of the water and of the surrounding air can affect evaporation rates. The amount of water vapor already in the air can affect evaporation rates. So the humidity of the air affects evaporation. And then lastly, wind. If the air is still or if the air is moving can affect how fast evaporation occurs. So temperature, humidity, and wind all affect the rate and extent of evaporation. Temperature is the most obvious factor that influences evaporation. Notably, water can evaporate at any temperature. You know that if a little bit of water spills on a table, it eventually evaporates, even if the room temperature is not very warm. But the hotter the temperature of the air or the water, the more evaporation is going to take place. Why? Remember that temperature is the average kinetic energy of the atoms. So as the atoms gain more kinetic energy, they're better able to break the hydro hydrogen bonds that hold liquid water together, thus freeing the molecules to enter the air as vapor. This is a direct relationship. When temperature increases, evaporation increases. When temperature decreases, evaporation decreases. Some water will evaporate out of the pan, shown here, at any temperature. But as the water temperature increases, more and more water will evaporate. Eventually, though, the evaporation might slow down because of the humidity, which is our next factor, because as the water evaporates and there's more and more water molecules directly above the liquid water, the humidity of the air above the water is very high. So that brings us to our next factor. So let's look at the influence of humidity. Your textbook goes into this in more detail, and you should definitely read your, your textbook. But essentially, at any given temperature, there's a maximum amount of water vapor that the air can hold. You see this represented on this graph showing water vapor capacity. At 32 degrees Fahrenheit, the air doesn't hold much water. But as the air gets warmer, there's a higher water vapor capacity. Essentially, the air is holding more and more moisture. And if the air is dry, meaning it's far from the, the, the capacity of it to hold water, so say the air only has water represented by about this much, this high on the graph, and it could hold up to here, the air is pretty dry. Evaporation can occur quite easily. Consider how fast your clothes dry on a hot, dry day. However, if the air is already saturated, the air already holds its maximum water vapor, no more evaporation can take place. So at the same temperature in a humid location, your clothes would not dry. So a way to think about this is that at every temperature, there's a maximum amount of water that the air can hold. And if the air is already at that maximum, no evaporation can take place. However, if the air is far from that maximum, meaning the air is fairly dry, more evaporation can take place. This gives us some insight as to why humid locations like Georgia or Washington, D.C. feel so hot in the summer, even though their air temperature may only be about 80 degrees. 80 degrees in Georgia in the summertime feels much hotter than 100 degrees might feel here in dry California. Why? We can't sweat in Georgia. We cannot use evaporation to cool ourselves because the air is already saturated. Georgia has a much more humid summertime climate, which we'll discuss why later. But for now, Georgia has a very humid climate, and so the air is already saturated with water vapor, and evaporation does not occur very readily, even off of our own bodies. So we can't sweat, we can't cool ourselves, we feel hot. Let's look at this graph one more time and notice again that as 
air temperature goes up, the water vapor capacity goes up as well. And as temperature decreases, the water vapor capacity decreases. Notice that direct relationship. For our purposes, we can simply consider that warmer air can hold more water than cooler air. This is going to be very important later, as we'll see that as air rises and expands and cools, water will start to condense because the cool air can't hold all that water. It's oversaturated and water condenses and forms clouds. So as air rises and expands and cools, we have cloud formation. More on that later. The third factor that influences evaporation rate is wind. When water evaporates from a surface, the air immediately above it becomes saturated. If the saturated air stays there, no further evaporation will occur. But if that saturated air is blown away by wind, more evaporation can take place. Stop in the video and think about that concept for a moment. You're already a bit familiar with the concept because you know if you mop your floor and then put a fan on, your, dry, your floor will dry faster. Well, what's happening? Well, the fan is simply blowing away all of the moist air from above the floor so that the air above the floor is now again dry and more water can evaporate. All right, we should be able to explain the process of evaporation at the molecular level and then also discuss the three factors that influence the rate and extent of evaporation. So looking at this globally, where would we expect a lot of evaporation and thus a fairly high level of humidity? Well, we know that there's a lot of water present near the equator and there's high temperatures at the equator. So we would expect there to be a lot of evaporation there. Let's take a look at the humidity levels. Indeed, equatorial regions have a higher specific humidity as represented on this diagram. Looking back at the diagram, we've discussed how water can go through the process of evaporation to lead it to atmospheric moisture pool, which we call humidity. The next video clip is going to deal with humidity just wanted to point out one other thing here. We know that surface waters can also undergo evaporation to atmospheric moisture. And this diagram also shows plants, although they didn't label the pool. The plant pool undergoes something called evapotranspiration. That's two processes put together. Evaporation from the leaves directly, and then also transpiration, which is the water that's taken up from surface water or groundwater through the plant and out the leaves. And both of these processes, evaporation and transpiration, would lead to the atmospheric moisture pool. So in our diagram, the plant pool through evapotranspiration would lead an arrow back to atmospheric moisture. All right, that's the end of the evaporation video clip. I encourage you to check your own learning by stopping the video and answering these questions. Consider answering them in writing. They're not due, but it's definitely going to help you master the material.